This is section zero of Mark Twain speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mark Twain speaking by Mark Twain. Project Introduction. Editors and compilers of Mark Twain's speeches have faced a dismaying problem through the years since, while manuscripts of his speeches, one would assume, should represent what he intended to say, there's no way to be sure, because no recording devices existed, and he was famous for going off script. As a result, the editor of this collection of speeches, Paul Fathout, says he combined the best parts of available texts into these composite versions of each speech. In many cases, these composite versions partially duplicate speeches already recorded in another public domain recording, Mark Twain's Speeches, available at LibriVox.org. But the unrecorded sections of these composites deserve to be remembered also, and so are included here. In his introduction to his work, the editor, Paul Fathout, describes Twain's presentations as inimitable. With that in mind, no attempt to approximate Twain's inflections of speech, cadence, or drawl were made for this recording. Recorded by John Greenman. Section 1 of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Presentation Speech. McGuire's Opera House, San Francisco, June 12, 1864. Read by John Greenman. Major Perry, permit me, sir, on the part of your countless friends, the noble sons of the forest, the diggers, the Paiutes, the Washoes, the Shoshones, and the numberless and nameless tribes of Aborigines that roam the deserts of the Great Basin to the eastward of the snowy mountains further north, to present you this costly and beautiful cane, reared under their own eyes and fashioned by their own inspired hands. The red men whom I represent, although visibly black from the wear and tear of outdoor life, from contact with the impurities of the earth, and from the absence of soap and their natural indifference to water, admire the unblemished virtue and the spotless integrity which they find in you. Albeit these dusty savages are arrayed in rabbit skins, and their princely blood is food for the very vermin they cherish and protect, they still respect you, because your repugnance to graybacks, either in the way of food or society, and your antipathy to the skins of wild beasts as raiment, is bold, undisguised, and honest. Finally, although these dingy warriors see no blood upon your hands, no human bones about your neck, no scalps suspended from your belt, they behold in you a brave whom they delight to honor, for they see you in fancy on the war-path in the three fights on the bull's run field, again in the historic seven days' struggle before Richmond, and again sweeping down the lines with McClellan in the fire and smoke and thunder of battle at Antietam, with a wound in your leg and blood in your eye, and they honor you as they would a high you muckamuck of many tribes, with crimson blankets and a hundred squaws. I am charged to say to you that if you will visit the Campoodies of the nomads of the desert, you shall fare sumptuously upon crickets and grasshoppers and the fat of the land. The skin of the wild coyote shall be your bed, and the daughters of the chiefs shall serve you. Receive the cane kindly, 
cherish it in memory of your savage friends in san francisco and bear in mind always the lesson it teaches its head is formed of a human hand clasping a fish the hand will cling to the fish through good or evil fortune until one or the other is destroyed and the moral it teaches is this when you undertake a thing stick to it through storm and sunshine never flinch never yield an inch never give up hold your grip till you bust you have been a citizen of san francisco four months major perry you came to raise the aquila with captain merritt and you did it and did it well she rides at anchor in the bay you held your grip the consciousness of your success will be half your reward and the other half will be duly paid in greenbacks by the government your labor is finished you are now about to leave us tomorrow for your old home across the seas and we are here to bid you godspeed and a safe voyage in the name of winnemucca war chief of the paiutes sioux sioux chief of the washoes buckskin joe chief of the pit rivers buffalo jim chief of the bannocks washaki grand chief of the shoshones and further in the names of the lordly chiefs of all the swarthy tribes that breathe the free air of the hills and plains of the pacific coast i salute you behold they stand before you thirsty end of presentation speech read by john greenman this is section two of mark twain speaking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sandwich Islands Lecture, October 2, 1866. Given intermittently afterwards until December 8, 1873. Read by John Greenman. Ladies and gentlemen, the next lecture in this course will be delivered this evening by Samuel L. Clemens, a gentleman whose high character and unimpeachable integrity are only equaled by his comeliness of person and grace of manner and i am the man i was obliged to excuse the chairman from introducing me because he never compliments anybody and i knew i could do it just as well the sandwich islands will be the subject of my lecture when i get to it and i shall endeavor to tell the truth as nearly as a newspaper man can if i embellish it with a little nonsense that makes no difference it won't mar the truth it is only as the barnacle ornaments the oyster by sticking to it that figure is original with me i was born back from tidewater and don't know as the barnacle does stick to the oyster unfortunately the first object i ever saw in the sandwich islands was a repulsive one it was a case of oriental leprosy of so dreadful a nature that i have never been able to get it out of my mind since i don't intend that it shall give a disagreeable complexion to this lecture at all but inasmuch as it was the first thing i saw in those islands it naturally suggested itself when i proposed to talk about the islands it is a very hard matter to get a disagreeable object out of one's memory i discovered that a good while ago when i made that funeral excursion in the quaker city they showed me some very interesting objects in the cathedral and i expected to recollect every one of them but i didn't i forgot every one of them except one and that i remembered because it was unpleasant it was a curious piece of ancient sculpture 
they don't know where they got it nor how long they have had it it is a stone figure of a man without any skin a freshly skinned man showing every vein artery and tissue it was the heaviest thing and yet there was something fascinating about it it looked so natural it looked as if it was in pain and you know a freshly skinned man would naturally look that way he would unless his attention was occupied with some other matter it was a dreadful object and i have been sorry many a time since that i ever saw that man sometimes i dream of him sometimes he is standing by my bedpost sometimes he is stretched between the sheets touching me the most uncomfortable bedfellow i ever had i can't get rid of unpleasant recollections once when i ran away from school i was afraid to go home at night so i crawled through a window and laid down on a lounge in my father's office the moon shed a ghastly light in the room and presently i descried a long dark mysterious shape on the floor i wanted to go and touch it but i didn't i restrained myself i didn't do it i had a good deal of presence of mind tried to go to sleep kept thinking of it by and by when the moonlight fell upon it i saw that it was a dead man lying there with his white face turned up in the moonlight i never was so sick in all my life i never wanted to walk so bad i went away from there i didn't hurry simply went out of the window and took the sash along with me i didn't need the sash but it was handier to take it than to leave it i wasn't scared but i was a good deal agitated i have never forgotten that man he had fallen dead in the street and they brought him in there to try him and they brought him in guilty too i am losing time what i have been saying don't bear strictly on the sandwich islands but one reminiscence leads to another and i am obliged to bring myself down in this way on account of that unpleasant thing that i first saw there it is not safe to come to any important matter in an entirely direct way when a young gentleman is about to talk to a young lady about matrimony he don't go straight at it he begins by talking about the weather i have done that many a time my next remarks will refer to the sandwich islands now if an impression has gotten abroad in the land that the sandwich islands are in south america that is an error i wish to attack that is the error i wish to combat to cut the matter short the sandwich isles are two thousand miles southwest from san francisco but why they were put away out there in the middle of the pacific so far away from any place and in such an inconvenient locality is no business of ours it was the work of providence and is not open to question the subject is a good deal like many others we should like to inquire into such as what mosquitoes were made for etc but under the circumstances we naturally feel a delicacy about doing it the islands are a dozen in number and their entire area is not greater i suppose than that of rhode island and connecticut combined they are of volcanic origin of volcanic construction i should say there is not a spoonful of legitimate dirt in the whole group unless it has been imported eight of the islands are inhabited 
and four of them are entirely girdled with a belt of mountains comprising the most productive sugar lands in the world the sugar lands in louisiana are considered rich and yields from five hundred to one thousand seven hundred pounds per acre a two hundred acre crop of wheat in the states is worth twenty or thirty thousand dollars a two hundred acre crop of sugar in these islands is worth two hundred thousand dollars you could not do that in this country unless you planted it with stamps and reaped it in bonds i could go on talking about the sugar interest all night and i have a notion to do it uh, but i will spare you it is very interesting to those who are interested in it but i'll drop it now you will find it all in the patent office reports and i can recommend them as the most placid literature in the world these islands were discovered some eighty or ninety years ago by captain cook though another man came very near discovering them before and he was diverted from his course by a manuscript found in a bottle he wasn't the first man who has been diverted by suggestions got out of a bottle when these islands were discovered the population was about four hundred thousand but the white man came and brought various complicated diseases and education and civilization and all sorts of calamities and consequently the population began to drop off with commendable activity forty years ago they were reduced to two hundred thousand and the educational and civilizing facilities being increased they dwindled down to fifty five thousand and it is proposed to send a few more missionaries and finish them it isn't the education or civilization that has settled them it is the imported diseases and they have all got the consumption and other reliable distempers and to speak figuratively they are retiring from business pretty fast when they pick up and leave we will take possession as lawful heirs there are about three thousand white people in the islands they are mostly americans in fact they are the kings of the sandwich islands the monarchy is not much more than a mere name these people stand as high in the scale of character as any people in the world and some of them who were born and educated in those islands don't even know what vice is a kanaka or a native is nobody unless he has a princely income of seventy five dollars annually or a splendid estate worth one hundred dollars the country is full of office holders and office seekers there are plenty of such noble patriots of almost any party of three men two would be office holders and one an office seeker in a little island half the size of one of the wards of st louis there are lots of noblemen princes and men of high degree with grand titles holding big offices receiving immense salaries such as ministers of war secretaries of the navy secretaries of state and ministers of justice they make a fine display of uniforms and are very imposing at a funeral that's the country for a petty hero to go to he would soon have the conceit taken out of him there are so many of them that a nobleman from any other country would be nobody they only lionize their own people and therefore they lionize everybody in color the natives are a rich dark brown a sort of black and tan a very pleasing tint the tropical sun 
and the easy-going ways inherited from their ancestors have made them rather idle but they are not vicious at all they are good people the native women in the rural districts wear a loose magnificent curtain calico garment but the men don't upon great occasions the men wear an umbrella or some little fancy article like that further than this they have no inclination toward gorgeousness of attire in the old times the king was absolute his person was sacred and if even the shadow of a common kanaka fell upon him the kanaka had to die there was no help for him whatever the king tabooed it was death to touch or speak of after the king came the high priests who sacrificed human victims after them came the great feudal chiefs and then the common kanakas who were the slaves of all and wretchedly oppressed away down at the bottom of this pyramid were the women the abject slaves of the whole party they did all the work and were cruelly mistreated it was death for a woman to sit at table with her husband or to eat of the choice fruits of the islands at any time they seemed to have had a sort of dim knowledge of what came of women eating fruit in the garden of eden and they didn't feel justified in taking any more chances and it is wisdom unquestionably it is wisdom adam wasn't strict enough eve broke the taboo and hence comes all this trouble can't be too particular about fruit with women they were a rusty set all round those kanakas by and by the american missionaries came and they struck off the shackles from the whole race breaking the power of the kings and chiefs they set the common man free elevated his wife to a position of equality and gave a spot of land to each to hold forever the missionaries taught the whole nation to read and write with facility in the native tongue i don't suppose there is to-day a single uneducated person above eight years of age in the sandwich islands it is the best educated country in the world i believe not excepting portions of the united states that has all been done by the american missionaries and in a large degree it was paid for by the american sunday school children with their pennies we all took part in it true the system gave opportunities to bad boys many a bad boy acquired the habit of confiscating pennies of the missionary cause but it is one of the proudest recollections of my life that i never did that at least not more than once or twice i know that i contributed i have had nearly two dollars invested there for thirty years but i don't mind it i don't care for the money if it has been doing good i don't say this in order to show off but just mention it as a gentle humanizing fact that may possibly have a benevolent and beneficent effect upon some members of this audience these natives are very hospitable people indeed very hospitable if you want to stay a few days and nights in a native's cabin you can stay and welcome they will do everything they possibly can to make you comfortable they will feed you on baked dog or poi or raw fish or raw salt pork fricasseed cats all the luxuries of the season everything the human heart can desire they will set before you perhaps now uh, this isn't a captivating feast at first glance but it is offered in all sincerity and with the best motives in the world 
and that makes any feast respectable whether it is palatable or not but if you want to trade that's quite another matter that's business and the kanaker is ready for you he is a born trader and he will swindle you if he can he will lie straight through from the first word to the last not such lies as you and i tell but gigantic lies lies that awe you with their grandeur lies that stun you with their imperial impossibility he will sell you a molehill at the market price of a mountain and will lie it up to an altitude that will make it cheap at the money if he is caught he slips out of it with an easy indifference that has an unmistakable charm about it one peculiarity of these kanakas is that nearly every one of them has a dozen mothers oh, not natural ones i haven't got down yet where i can make such a statement as that but adopted mothers they have a custom of calling any woman mother they take a liking to no matter what her color or politics and it is possible for one native to have a thousand mothers if his affections are liberal and stretchy and most of them are this custom breeds some curious incidents a california man went down there and opened a sugar plantation one of his hands came and said he wanted to bury his mother he gave him permission shortly after he came again with the same request i thought you buried her last week said the gentleman this is another one said the native all right said the gentleman go and plant her within a month the man wanted to bury some more mothers look here said the planter i don't want to be hard on you in your affliction but it appears to me that your stock of mothers holds out pretty well it interferes with business so clear out and never come back until you have buried every mother you have in the world they are an odd sort of people too they can die whenever they want to that's a fact they don't mind dying any more than a jilted frenchman does when they take a notion to die they die and it don't make any difference whether there is anything the matter with them or not and they can't be persuaded out of it when one of them makes up his mind to die he just lays down and is just as certain to die as though he had all the doctors in the world hold of him a gentleman in hawaii asked his servant if he wouldn't like to die and have a big funeral he said yes and looked happy and the next morning the overseer came and said that boy of yours laid down and died last night and said you were going to give him a fine funeral they are very fond of funerals big funerals are their main weakness fine grave clothes fine funeral appointments and a long procession are things they take a generous delight in years ago a kanaka and his wife were condemned to be hanged for murder they received the sentence with manifest satisfaction because it gave an opening for a funeral you know it makes but little difference to them whose it is they would as soon attend their own funeral as anybody else's this couple were of consequence and had landed estates they sold every foot of ground they had and laid it out in fine clothes to be hung in and the woman appeared on the scaffold in a white satin dress and slippers and feathers of gaudy ribbon and the man was arrayed in a gorgeous vest blue claw hammer coat and brass buttons and white kid gloves as the noose was adjusted around his neck he blew his nose with a grand theatrical flourish so as to show his embroidered white handkerchief i never 
never knew of a couple who enjoyed hanging more than they did they are very fond of dogs these people not the great newfoundland or the stately mastiff but a species of little mean contemptible cur that a white man would condemn to death on general principles there is nothing attractive about these dogs there is not a handsome feature about them unless it is their bushy tails a friend of mine said if he had one of these dogs he would cut off the tail and throw the rest of the dog away they feed this dog pet him take ever so much care of him and then cook and eat him i couldn't do that i would rather go hungry for two days than devour an old personal friend in that way but many a white citizen of those islands throws aside his prejudices and takes his dinner off one of those puppies and after all it is only our cherished american sausage with the mystery removed a kanaka will eat anything he can bite a live fish scales and all which must be rather annoying to the fish but the kanaka doesn't mind that it used to be said that the kanakas were cannibals but that was a slander they didn't eat captain cook or if they did it was only for fun there was one instance of cannibalism a foreigner from the south pacific islands set up an office and did eat a good many kanakas he was a useful citizen but had strong political prejudices and used to save up a good appetite for just before election so that he could thin out the democratic vote at this point in my lecture in other cities i usually illustrate cannibalism but i am a stranger here and don't feel like taking liberties still if any one in the audience will lend me an infant i will illustrate the matter but it is of no consequence it don't matter i know children have become scarce and high owing to the inattention they have received since the women's rights movement began i will leave out that part of my program though it is very neat and pleasant yet it is not necessary i am not hungry well that foreign cannibal after a while got tired of kanakas as most anybody would and thought he would like to try white man with onions so he captured and devoured a tough old whale-ship captain but it was the worst thing he ever did of course he could no more digest that old whaler than a keg of nails there is no telling how much he suffered with this sin on his conscience and the whaler on his stomach he lingered for a few days and then died now i don't believe this story myself and have only told it for its moral you don't appear to see the moral but i know there is a moral in it because i have told it thirty or forty times and never got a moral out of it yet with all these excellent and hospitable ways these kanakas have some cruel instincts they will put a live chicken in the fire just to see it hop about in the olden times they used to be cruel to themselves they used to tear their hair and burn their flesh shave their heads knock out an eye or a couple of front teeth when a great person or a king died just to testify to their sorrow and if their grief was so sore that they couldn't possibly bear it they would go out and scalp their neighbor or burn his house down it was an excellent custom too for it gave everyone a good opportunity to square up old grudges pity we didn't have it here they would also kill an infant now and then bury him alive sometimes 
but the missionaries have annihilated infanticide for my part i can't see why the ladies of the sandwich islands have a great many pleasant customs which i don't know but we might practice with profit here the women all ride like men i wish to introduce that reform in this country our ladies ought by all means to ride like men these side saddles are so dangerous when women meet each other in the road they run and kiss and hug each other and they don't blackguard each other behind each other's backs i would like to introduce that reform also i don't suppose our ladies do it but they might but i believe i am getting on dangerous ground i won't pursue that any further these people do nearly everything wrong and first they buckle the saddle on the right side which is the wrong side they mount a horse from the wrong side they turn out on the wrong side to let you go by they use the same word to say good-bye and good morning they use yes when they mean no the women smoke more than the men do when they beckon to you to come toward them they always motion in the opposite direction the only native bird that has handsome feathers has only two and they are under its wings instead of on top of its head frequently a native cat has a tail only two inches long and has got a knot tied in the end of it the native duck lives on the dry tops of mountains five thousand feet high the natives always stew chickens instead of baking them they dance at funerals and sing a dismal heartbroken dirge when they are happy and with atrocious perverseness they wash your shirts with a club and iron them with a brickbat in their playing of the noble american game of seven up that's a game well i'll explain that by and by some of you perhaps know all about it and the rest must guess but in their playing of that really noble and intellectual game the dealer deals to his right instead of to his left and what is insufferably worse the ten always takes the ace now such abject ignorance as that is reprehensible and for one i am glad the missionaries have gone there now you see what kind of voters you will have if you take those islands away from these people as we are pretty sure to do some day they will do everything wrong and first they will make a deal of trouble here too instead of fostering and encouraging a judicious system of railway speculation and all that sort of thing they will elect the most incorruptible men to congress yes they will turn everything upside down in honolulu they are the most easy-going people in the world some of our people are not acquainted with their customs they started a gas company once and put the gas at thirteen dollars a thousand feet they only took in sixteen dollars the first month they all went to bed at dark they are an excellent people i speak earnestly they do not even know the name of some of the vices in this country a lady called on a doctor she wanted something for general debility he ordered her to drink porter she called him again the porter had done her no good he asked her how much porter she had taken she said a tablespoon in a tumbler of water i wish we could import such blessed ignorance into this country they don't do much drinking there when they have paid the tax for importing the liquor they have got nothing left to purchase the liquor with they are very innocent and drink anything that is liquid kerosene turpentine hair oil in one town on the fourth of july an entire community got drunk on a barrel of mrs winslow's soothing syrup 
the chief glory of the sandwich islands is their great volcano the volcano of kilauea is seventeen thousand feet in diameter and from seven hundred to eight hundred feet deep vesuvius is nowhere it is the largest volcano in the world shoots up flames tremendously high you witness a scene of unrivaled sublimity and witness the most astonishing sights when the volcano of kilaio broke through a few years ago lava flowed out of it for twenty days and twenty nights and made a stream forty miles in length till it reached the sea tearing up forests in its awful fiery path swallowing up huts destroying all vegetation rioting through shady dells and sinuous canyons amidst this carnival of destruction majestic columns of smoke ascended and formed a cloudy murky pall overhead sheets of green blue lambent flames were shot upward and pierced the vast gloom making all sublimely grand the natives are indifferent to volcanic terrors during the progress of an eruption they ate drank bought sold planted builded apparently indifferent to the roar of consuming forests the startling detonations the hissing of escaping steam the rending of the earth the shivering and melting of gigantic rocks the raging and dashing of the fiery waves the bellowings and unearthly mutterings coming up from a burning deep they went carelessly on amid the rain of ashes sand and fiery scintillations gazing vacantly at the ever varying appearance of the atmosphere murky black livid blazing the sudden rising of lofty pillars of flame the upward curling of ten thousand columns of smoke and their majestic roll in dense and lurid clouds all these moving phenomena were regarded by them as the fall of a shower or the running of a brook while to others they were as the tokens of a burning world the departing heavens and a coming judge there i'm glad i've got that volcano off my mind i once knew a great tall gawky country editor near sacramento to whom i sent an ode on the sea starting with the long green swell of the pacific the country editor sent back a letter and stated i couldn't fool him and he didn't want any base insinuations from me he knew who i meant when i wrote the long green swell of the pacific there is one thing characteristic of the tropics that a stranger must have whether he likes it or not and that is the boo-hoo fever its symptoms are nausea of the stomach severe headache backache and bellyache and a general utter indifference whether school keeps or not you can't be a full citizen of the sandwich islands unless you have had the boo-hoo fever you will never forget it i remember a little boy who had it once there a new yorker asked him if he was afraid to die he said no i am not afraid to die of anything except the boo-hoo fever the climate of these islands is delightful it is beautiful in honolulu the thermometer stands at about eighty or eighty two degrees pretty much all the year round don't change more than twelve degrees in twelve months in the sugar districts the thermometer stands at seventy and does not change at all any kind of thermometer will do one without any quicksilver is just as good eighty degrees by the seashore and 
seventy degrees farther inland and sixty degrees as you ascend the slope of the mountain and as you go higher fifty degrees forty thirty and ever decreasing in temperature till you get to the top where it's so cold that you can't speak the truth i know for i've been there the climate is wonderfully healthy for white people in particular so healthy that white people venture on the most reckless imprudence they get up too early you can see them as early as half past seven in the morning and they attend to all their business and keep it up till sundown it don't hurt em don't kill em and yet it ought to do so i have seen it so hot in california that greenbacks went up to a hundred and forty-two in the shade these sandwichers believe in a superstition that the biggest liars in the world have got to visit the islands some time before they die they believe that because it is a fact oh you misunderstand i mean that when liars get there they stay there they have several specimens they boast of they treasure up their little perfections and they allude to them as if the man was inspired from below they had a man among them named morgan he never allowed any one to tell a bigger lie than himself and he always told the last one too when someone was telling about the natural bridge in virginia he said he knew all about it as his father had helped to build it someone was bragging of a wonderful horse he had morgan told them of one he had once while out riding one day a thunder shower came on and chased him for eighteen miles and never caught him not a single drop of rain dropped on to his horse but his dog was swimming behind the wagon the whole of the way once when the subject of mean men was being discussed morgan told them of an incorporated company of mean men they hired a poor fellow to blast rock for them he drilled a hole four feet deep put in the powder and began to tamp it down around the fuse i know all about tamping as i have worked in a mine myself the crowbar struck a spark and caused a premature explosion and that man and his crowbar shot up into the air and he went higher and higher till he didn't look bigger than a boy and he kept on going higher and higher until he didn't look bigger than a dog and he kept on going higher and higher until he didn't look bigger than a bee and then he went out of sight and presently he came in sight again looking no bigger than a bee and he came further and further until he was as big as a dog and further and further and further until he was as big as a boy and he came further and further until he assumed the full size and shape of a man and he came down and fell right into the same old spot and went to tamping again and would you believe it concluded morgan although that poor fellow was not gone more than fifteen minutes yet that mean company docked him for loss of time the land that i have tried to tell you about lies out there in the midst of the watery wilderness in the very heart of the almost soilless solitudes of the pacific it is a dreamy beautiful charming land i wish i could make you comprehend how beautiful it is it is a land that seems ever so vague and fairy-like when one reads about it in books peopled with a gentle indolent careless race it is sunday land the land of indolence and dreams where the air is drowsy and things tend to repose and peace and to emancipation from the labor and turmoil and weariness and anxiety of life end of sandwich islands lecture read by john greenman
This is section three of Mark Twain speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concluding remarks, San Francisco, December tenth, eighteen sixty six, read by John Greenman. My friends and fellow citizens, I have been treated with extreme kindness and cordiality by San Francisco, and I wish to return my sincerest thanks and acknowledgments. I have also been treated with marked and unusual generosity, forbearance, and good fellowship by my ancient comrades, my brethren of the press, a thing which has peculiarly touched me, because long experience in the service has taught me that we of the press are slow to praise but quick to censure each other as a general thing wherefore in thanking them i am anxious to convince them at the same time that they have not lavished their kind offices upon one who cannot appreciate or is insensible to them i am now about to bid farewell to san francisco for a season and to go back to that common home we all tenderly remember in our waking hours and fondly revisit in dreams of the night a home which is familiar to my recollection but will be an unknown land to my unaccustomed eyes i shall share the fate of many another longing exile who wanders back to his early home to find gray hairs where he expected youth graves where he looked for firesides grief where he had pictured joy everywhere change remorseless change where he had heedlessly dreamed that desolating time had stood still to find his cherished anticipations a mockery and to drink the lees of disappointment instead of the beaded wine of a hope that is crowned with its fruition and while i linger here upon the threshold of this my new home to say to you my kindest and my truest friends a warm good-bye and an honest peace and prosperity attend you i accept the warning that mighty changes will have come over this home also when my returning feet shall walk these streets again i read the signs of the times and i that am no prophet behold the things that are in store for you over slumbering california is stealing the dawn of a radiant future the great china mail line is established the pacific railroad is creeping across the continent the commerce of the world is about to be revolutionized california is crown princess of the new dispensation she stands in the center of the grand highway of the nations she stands midway between the old world and the new and both shall pay her tribute from the far east and from europe multitudes of stout hearts and willing hands are preparing to flock hither to throng her hamlets and villages to till her fruitful soil to unveil the riches of her countless mines to build up an empire on these distant shores that shall shame the bravest dreams of her visionaries from the opulent lands of the orient from india from china japan the amur from tributary regions that stretch from the arctic circle to the equator is about to pour in upon her the princely commerce of a teeming population of four hundred and fifty million souls 
half the world stands ready to lay its contributions at her feet has any other state so brilliant a future has any other city a future like san francisco this straggling town shall be a vast metropolis this sparsely populated land shall become a crowded hive of busy men your waste places shall blossom like the rose and your deserted hills and valleys shall yield bread and wine for unnumbered thousands railroads shall be spread hither and thither and carry the invigorating blood of commerce to regions that are languishing now mills and workshops yea and factories shall spring up everywhere and minds that have neither name nor place to-day shall dazzle the world with their affluence the time is drawing on apace when the clouds shall pass away from your firmament and a splendid prosperity shall descend like a glory upon the whole land i am bidding the old city and my old friends a kind but not a sad farewell for i know that when i see this home again the changes that will have been wrought upon it will suggest no sentiment of sadness its estate will be brighter happier and prouder a hundredfold than it is this day this is its destiny and in all sincerity i can say so mote it be end of concluding remarks read by john greenman this is section four of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in a public domain address to the czar yalta russia august twenty fifth eighteen sixty seven read by john greenman your imperial majesty we are a handful of private citizens of america traveling simply for recreation and unostentatiously as becomes our unofficial state and therefore we have no excuse to tender for presenting ourselves before your majesty save the desire of offering our grateful acknowledgments to the lord of a realm which through good and evil report has been the steadfast friend of the land we love so well we could not presume to take a step like this did we not know well that the words we speak here and the sentiments wherewith they are freighted are but the reflex of the thoughts and feelings of all our countrymen from the green hills of new england to the shores of the far pacific we are few in number but we utter the voice of a nation one of the brightest pages that has graced the world's history since written history had birth was recorded by your majesty's hand when it loosed the bonds of twenty million serfs and americans can but esteem it a privilege to do honor to a ruler who has wrought so great a deed the lesson that was taught us then we have profited by and are free in truth to-day even as we were before in name america owes much to russia is indebted to her in many ways and chiefly for her unwavering friendship in seasons of our greatest need that that friendship may still be hers in times to come we confidently pray that she is and will be grateful to russia and to her sovereign for it we know full well that she will ever forfeit it by any premeditated unjust act or unfair course it were treason to believe end of address to the czar read by john greenman
This is section five of Mark Twain Speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pilgrim Life San Francisco, April fourteenth and fifteenth, eighteen sixty eight. Read by John Greenman. In conclusion, I will observe that even galloping as we did about the world, we learned something. The lesson of the excursion was a good one. It taught us that foreign countries are excellent to travel in, but that the best country to live in is America, after all. We found no soap in the hotels of Europe, and they charged us for candles we never burned. We saw no ladies anywhere that were as beautiful as our own ladies here at home, and especially in this audience. We saw none anywhere that dressed with such excellent taste as do our ladies at home here. I am not a married man, but, but I would like to be. I only mention it in the most casual way, though, and do not mean anything, anything personal by it. We saw no government on the other side like our own, not just like our own. The Sultan's was a little like it. One of his great officers came into office without assent, and went out in a few years and built himself a palace worth three million. It brought tears to my eyes in that far foreign land. It was so like home. The Sultan confiscated it. He said he liked to see a man prosper, but he didn't like to see him get wealthy on two thousand a year and no perquisites. We saw no energy in the capitals of Europe like the tremendous energy of New York, and we saw no place where intelligence and enterprise were so widely diffused as they are here in our country. We saw nowhere any architectural achievement that was so beautiful to the eye as the national capital of America at Washington, and we saw nowhere any building that was, that was, just like our own Washington Monument. We saw no people anywhere so self-denying and patriotic and prompt in collecting their salaries as our own members of Congress. We saw nothing in Europe, Asia, or Africa to make us wish to live there, and when the voyage was done, and it was a very, very pleasant one, take it all together, we were glad to get back to our own country where moral and religious freedom prevail, where politicians are incorruptible, where accident policies are cheap, and where the chances to get your money back are good on all the railroads. Ah, I had rather live here than in Turkey, in Constantinople, with its beggars, its dogs, its ugly overpraised mosques, its sultan who has eight hundred wives and yet isn't happy. It is a perfectly unanswerable argument against matrimony. If a man can't be happy with eight hundred wives, what chance is there for him with only one? None in the world. People tell me that it makes a man happy to have a woman love him, and I used to be innocent enough to believe it before I went to Constantinople. Theorizing is all very well, but facts and figures are better. If the love of just one woman could make a man so happy, what ought to be the natural result if he had the love of eight hundred of them? Why, he just simply couldn't stand so much bliss, that is all. He couldn't live through it. Such a deluge of deliciousness as that would be bound to swamp him. He couldn't contain all that sweetness any more than a one-gallon jug could contain 
eight hundred gallons of sugar house molasses sentiment is all very well but sentiment can't stand the test of mathematics travel hath made me wise and i warn the youth of blank to beware of matrimony it is a delusion and a snare i have seen it under its most favorable aspect and i ought to know whereof i speak it is my deliberate judgment that a man that a man wouldn't be happy with forty thousand wives the sultan of turkey talked to me like a father he saw that i sympathized with him and he opened his heart and told me all his troubles he said why governor you can't imagine the expense and the bother that all those women cost me why it isn't fifteen minutes ago since my ugliest wife and she is a spectacle to look at number six hundred and forty two i have forgotten her other name was in here trying to get me to buy her one hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry oh an ugly woman hasn't got any effrontery you know and another one number four hundred and twenty two came right after her with a black eye she'd had a fight with number seven hundred and sixty four and got the worst of it and then he said this great fat regiment of wives the manuscript breaks off here end of pilgrim life read by john greenman this is section six of mark twain speaking this librivox recording is in the public domain introductory remarks mercantile library san francisco july second eighteen sixty eight read by john greenman ladies and gentlemen if any one in san francisco has a just right this evening to feel gratified uh, more uh, to feel proud it is i who stand before you the compliment of your attendance here i thoroughly appreciate it is a greater compliment than i really deserve perhaps but for that matter i have always been rather better treated in san francisco than i actually deserved i am willing to say that i appreciate your attendance here tonight all the more because there was such a wide spread such a furious such a determined opposition to my lecturing upon this occasion pretty much the entire community wrote petitions imploring me not to lecture to forbear to have compassion upon a persecuted people i never had such a unanimous call to 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 leave before but i resisted and am here and i am glad that i am privileged to address a full house instead of having to pour out this cataract of wisdom upon empty benches i do not exactly propose to instruct you this evening but rather to tell you a good many things which you have known very well before no doubt but which may have grown dim in your memories for the multifarious duties and annoyances of daily life are apt to drive from our minds a large part of what we learn and that knowledge is of little use which we cannot recall so i simply propose to refresh your memories i trust this will be considered sufficient apology for making this lecture somewhat didactic i don't know what didactic means but it is a good high-sounding word and i wish to use it meaning 
no harm whatever. End of surviving text from that lecture. Read by John Greenman. This is section seven of Mark Twain speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The American Vandal Abroad. Lyceum Season, November 17, 1868 to March 3, 1869. Read by John Greenman. I am to speak of the American Vandal this evening, but I wish to say in advance that I do not use the term in derision or apply it as a reproach but i use it because it is convenient and duly and properly modified it best describes the roving independent free and easy character of that class of traveling americans who are not elaborately educated cultivated and refined and gilded and filigreed with the ineffable graces of the first society the best class of our countrymen who go abroad keep us well posted about their doings in foreign lands but their brethren vandals cannot sing their own praises or publish their adventures the american vandal goes everywhere and is always at home everywhere he attempts to investigate the secrets of the harems he views the rock where paul was let down in a basket and seriously asks where the basket is he will choke himself to death trying to smoke a turkish pipe and swears it is good he will go into ecstasies over the insufferable horrors of the turkish bath though he is thinking the while that he may never come out alive he learns to ride a camel he packs his trunk with figs and other little vegetables he looks picturesque when beholding rome from the dome of st peter's his soul is full of admiration he rises above earthly cares he is proud and looks proud his countenance is beaming he does not fail to let the public know that he is an american this is not a fault it is commendable i have seen him in the company of kings and queens lords and popes he is always self-possessed always untouched unabashed even in the presence of the sphinx the american vandal gallops over england scotland spain and switzerland and finally brings up in italy he thinks it is the proper thing to visit genoa the stately old city of palaces whose vast marble edifices almost meet together over streets so narrow that three men can hardly walk abreast in them and so crooked that a man generally comes out of them about the same place he went in at he only stays in genoa long enough to see a few celebrated things and get some fragments of stone from the house columbus was born in for your genuine vandal is an intolerable and incorrigible relic gatherer it is estimated that if all the fragments of stone brought from columbus's house by travelers were collected together they would suffice to build a house fourteen thousand feet long and sixteen thousand feet high and i suppose they would next he hurries to milan and takes notes of the grand cathedral for he is always taking notes oh i remember milan and the noble cathedral well enough that marble miracle of enchanting architecture i remember how we entered and walked about its vast spaces and among its huge columns gazing aloft at the monster windows all aglow with 
brilliantly colored scenes in the life of the savior and his followers and i remember the side shows and curiosities there too the guide showed us a coffee-colored piece of sculpture which he said was considered to have come from the hand of phidias since it was not possible that any other man of any epoch could have copied nature with such faultless accuracy the figure was that of a man without a skin with every vein artery muscle every fiber and tendon and tissue of the human frame represented in minute detail it looked natural because it looked somehow as if it were in pain a skinned man would be likely to look that way unless his attention were occupied by some other matter it was a hideous thing and yet there was a fascination about it somewhere i am very sorry i saw it because i shall always see it now i shall dream of it sometimes i shall dream that it is resting its corded arms on the bed's head and looking down on me with its dead eyes i shall dream that it is stretched between the sheets with me and touching me with its exposed muscles and its stringy cold legs they have many holy relics in the cathedral of milan the priest showed us two of st paul's fingers and one of st peter's and a bone of judas iscariot it was a black one and bones and little vessels of blood of st john st mark and several other of the disciples they keep these relics in vials in a glass case and have them labeled as we often see geological specimens and they showed us a handkerchief in which the saviour had left the impression of his face we saw another in rome afterward and a piece of the stone the angels rolled away from the door of the holy sepulchre we saw the whole of the stone afterward in jerusalem and a part of the real crown of thorns we saw a whole one at notre dame in paris and a fragment of the purple robe worn by the saviour a nail from the true cross and a picture of the virgin and child painted by the veritable hand of st luke in every cathedral into which the american vandal wanders all over europe and especially italy he finds repetitions of these same relics until finally he becomes so accustomed to them and so attached to them that a cathedral that hasn't a pretended splinter of the cross or piece of a saint or fragment of a martyr to show has no charm for him i knew one of these gentry a simple-minded innocent vandal he was and very vulgar who had a perfect passion for these things whenever he went into a great cathedral when everybody was going into ecstasies over the grand architecture and paintings and such things he'd beckon to a priest and say here friend stuffy trot out your relics he didn't mean any disrespect but that was his way you know the vandal goes to see the ancient and most celebrated painting in the world the last supper we all know it in engravings the disciples all sitting on one side of a long plain table and christ with bowed head in the centre all the last suppers in the world are copied from this painting it is so damaged now by the wear and tear of three hundred years that the figures can hardly be distinguished the vandal goes to see this picture which all the world praises looks at it with a critical eye and says it's a perfect old nightmare 
of a picture, and he wouldn't give forty dollars for a million like it. And I share his opinion. And then he is done with Milan. He paddles around the Lake of Como for a few days, and then takes the cars. He is bound for Venice, the oldest and the proudest and the princeliest republic that ever graced the earth. We put on a good many airs with our little infant republic of a century's growth, but we grow modest when we stand before this gray, old, imperial city that was a haughty, invincible, magnificent republic for fourteen hundred years. The Vandal is bound for Venice. He has a long, weary ride of it. But just as the day is closing he hears someone shout, Venice, and puts his head out of the window, and sure enough, afloat on the placid sea, a league away, lies the great city with its towers and domes and steeples drowsing in a golden mist of sunset. Have you been to Venice, and seen the winding canals and the stately edifices that border them all along, ornamented with the quaint devices and sculptures of a former age? And have you seen the great cathedral of St. Mark's, and the giant staircase, and the famous bridge of Sighs, and the great square of St. Mark's, and the ancient pillar, with the winged lion of St. Mark that stands on it, whose story and whose origin are a mystery, and the Rialto, where Shylock used to loan money on human flesh and other collateral? And have you seen the gondolas, and heard the romantic gondolier sing, as only the romantic gondolier can sing, according to the romances? I have heard the romantic gondoliers sing, we had just entered Venice at eight in the evening and were floating away toward the hotel. We were poking dismally around in the shadows among long rows of towering, untenanted buildings, and were very sad and disheartened and disappointed, for this was not the Venice we had expected. It was at such a time as this that this ragged, barefooted gutter snipe turned up and began to sing, true to the traditions of his race. I stood it for about five minutes, and then I said, Look here, Rodrigo Gonzalez, Michael Angelo Smith, I am a pilgrim, and I am a stranger, but I'm not going to stand any such caterwauling as that. If this thing goes on, one of us has got to take water. It is enough that my cherished dreams of Venice have been blighted forever without taxing your talents to make the matter worse. Another yelp out of you, and overboard you go. I had begun to feel that the old Venice of song and story had departed forever, but I was too hasty. In a few minutes we swept gracefully out into the Grand Canal, and under the mellow moonlight the Venice of poetry and romance stood revealed. Right from the water's edge rose stately palaces of marble. Gondolas were gliding swiftly hither and thither, and disappearing suddenly through unsuspected gates and alleys. Ponderous stone bridges threw their shadows athwart the glittering waves. There was life and motion everywhere, and yet everywhere there was a hush, a stealthy sort of stillness that was suggestive of secret enterprises of bravos and of lovers, and, clad half in moonbeams and half in mysterious shadows, the grim old mansions of the Republic seemed to have an expression about them of having an eye out for just such enterprises as these at that moment. 
music came stealing over the waters venice was complete the gondola is an institution but it seems queer ever so queer this thing of a boat doing duty as a private carriage in venice we see business men come to the front door portly fellows with their portliness gauged according to their incomes step into a gondola instead of a street car and go off downtown to the counting-house we see young ladies out visiting stand on the stoop and laugh chatter and flirt their fans and kiss good-bye and say come soon maria now do you've been just as mean as ever you could and mother's dying to see you and so's the poodle and the cat and everybody and oh we've moved into the new house and oh it's such a love of a place so convenient to the post office and the church and the y m c a and we do have such fishing and such carrying on and such swimming matches in the back yard oh you must come no distance at all and if you go down through by st mark's and the bridge of size and out through the alley and come up by santa maria del frari and into the grand canal there isn't a bit of current now do come sally maria bye-bye and then the little humbug trips down the steps jumps into the gondola says under her breath disagreeable old thing i hope she won't come goes skimming away around the corner and the other girl slams the street door and says well that infliction's over anyway but i suppose i've got to go and see her tiresome stuck-up thing ah human nature is just the same all over the world and girls are just the same everywhere the girls in venice are just like the girls in cleveland they wear their dresses cut bias certainly and put the most gorgeous gussets on em and gores and all that sort of thing and wad up their hair behind so bewitchingly and prop it up with a crupper and they keep a pet kangaroo so as they can see how to do the grecian bend right ah the girls in venice are precisely like the girls in pittsburgh a venice girl is as much like a pittsburgh girl as 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 one blessed angel is like another and that was a close place but i rubbed through and we see the diffident young man mild of moustache affluent of hair indigent of brain elegant of costume drive up in his gondola to her father's mansion tell his hackman to bail out and wait start fearfully up the steps and meet the old man right on the threshold hear him ask what street the new british bank is in as if that were what he came for and then bounce into his boat and scurry away with his coward heart in his boots see him come sneaking around the corner again directly with a corner of the gondola curtain open toward the old gentleman's disappearing gondola and then out scampers his susan with a flock of little italian endearments fluttering from her lips and goes to drive with him in the watery avenues away down toward the rialto we see the ladies go out shopping in the most natural way and flit from street to street and from store to store just in the good old fashion except that they leave the gondola instead of a private carriage waiting for them a couple of hours at the curbstone waiting while they make the nice young clerks pull down tons and tons of silks and velvets and mombazine and bobinet and moire antiques and solferino and all those splendid fabrics 
and then they buy a paper of pins and go paddling up the canal to confer a portion of their disastrous patronage on the other stores and they always have their purchases sent home just in the good old way ah human nature is very much the same all over the world and it was so like my dear native home to see a lady buy ten cents worth of blue ribbon and have it sent home in a scow ah these little touches of nature move one almost to tears in those far-off foreign lands human nature is just the same all over the world blessed woman her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace i love the whole sex my own mother was a woman and we see little girls and boys go out for an airing with their nurses in the gondola when they've been good and haven't stolen any jam nor told any lies they couldn't substantiate i never had any trouble about going out for an airing when i was young because i never stole jam when i could get my little brother to steal it for me and i always made it a point to be just as particular about telling a lie as if i were telling the truth i'd rather have a sound judgment than talent and we see staid families with prayer-book and beads enter the gondola dressed in their sunday best and float solemnly away to church at midnight we see the theatre break up and discharge its swarm of chattering youth and beauty hear the cries of the hackman gondoliers and behold the struggling crowd jump aboard the black multitude of boats and go skimming down the moonlit avenues we see them branching off here and there and disappearing up divergent streets we hear the faint sounds of laughter of shouted farewells floating up out of the distance and then the strange pageant being gone we have lonely stretches of glittering water of stately buildings of blotting shadows of weird stone faces creeping into the moonlight of deserted bridges of motionless boats at anchor and over all broods that mysterious stillness that stealthy quiet that befits so well this old dreaming venice opposite this passage in the manuscript is a marginal note by mark twain very slow our vandals hurried away from venice and scattered abroad everywhere you could find them breaking specimens from the dilapidated tomb of romeo and juliet at padua and infesting the picture galleries of florence and risking their necks on the leaning tower of pisa and snuffing sulphur fumes on the summit of vesuvius and burrowing among the exhumed wonders of herculaneum and pompeii and you might see them with spectacles on and blue cotton umbrellas under their arms benignantly contemplating rome from the venerable arches of the Colosseum and finally we sailed from naples and in due time anchored before the piraeus the seaport of athens in greece but the quarantine was in force and so they set a guard of soldiers to watch us and would not let us go ashore however i and three other vandals took a boat and muffled the oars and slipped ashore at eleven thirty at night and dodged the guard successfully then we made a wide circuit around the slumbering town avoiding all roads and houses for they'd about as soon hang a body as not for violating the quarantine laws in those countries we got around the town without any accident and then struck out across the attic plain steering straight for athens over rocks and hills and brambles and everything with mount helicon for a landmark 
and so we tramped five or six miles the attic plain is a mighty uncomfortable plain to travel in even if it is so historical the armed guards got after us three times and flourished their gleaming gun barrels in the moonlight because they thought we were stealing grapes occasionally and the fact is we were for we found by and by that the brambles that tripped us up so often were grapevines but these people in the country didn't know that we were quarantine blockade runners and so they only scared us and jawed greek at us and let us go instead of arresting us we didn't care about athens particularly but we wanted to see the famous acropolis and its ruined temples and we did we climbed the steep hill of the acropolis about one in the morning and tried to storm that grand old fortress that had scorned the battles and sieges of three thousand years we had the garrison out mighty quick four greeks and we bribed them to betray the citadel and unlock the gates in a moment we stood in the presence of the noblest ruins we had ever seen the most elegant the most graceful the most imposing the renowned parthenon towered above us and about us were the wreck of what were once the snowy marble temples of hercules and a second minerva and another whose name i have forgotten most of the parthenon's grand columns are still standing but the roof is gone as we wandered down the marble-paved length of this mighty temple the scene was strangely impressive here and there in lavish profusion were gleaming white statues of men and women propped against blocks of marble some of them armless some without legs others headless but all looking mournful and sentient and startlingly human they rose up and confronted the midnight intruder on every side they stared at him with stony eyes from unlooked-for nooks and recesses they peered at him over fragmentary heaps far down the desolate corridors they barred his way in the midst of the broad forum and solemnly pointed with handless arms the way from the sacred fane and through the roofless temple the moon looked down and banded the floor and darkened the scattered fragments and broken statues with the slanting shadows of the columns what a world of ruined sculpture was about us stood up in rows stacked up in piles scattered broadcast over the wide area of the acropolis were hundreds of crippled statues of all sizes and of the most exquisite workmanship and vast fragments of marble that once belonged to the entablatures covered with bas-reliefs representing battles and sieges ships of war with three and four tiers of oars pageants and processions everything one could think of we walked out into the grass-grown fragment-strewn court beyond the parthenon it startled us every now and then to see a stony white face stare suddenly up at us out of the grass with its dead eyes the place seemed alive with ghosts we half expected to see the athenian heroes of twenty centuries ago glide out of the shadows and steal into the old temple they knew so well and regarded with such boundless pride the full moon was riding high in the cloudless heavens now we sauntered carelessly and unthinkingly to the edge of the lofty battlements of the citadel and looked down and lo a vision and such a vision athens by moonlight all the beauty in all the world combined could not rival it the prophet that thought the splendors of the new jerusalem were revealed to him surely saw this instead it lay in the level plain 
right under our feet all spread abroad like a picture and we looked down upon it as we might have looked from a balloon we saw no semblance of a street but every house every window every clinging vine every projection was as distinct and sharply marked as if the time were noonday and yet there was no glare no glitter nothing harsh or repulsive the silent city was flooded with the mellowest light that ever streamed from the moon and seemed like some living creature wrapped in peaceful slumber on its further side was a little temple whose delicate pillars and ornate front glowed with a rich luster that chained the eye like a spell and nearer by the palace of the king reared its creamy walls out of the midst of a great garden of shrubbery that was flecked all over with a random shower of amber lights a spray of golden sparks that lost their brightness in the glory of the moon and glinted softly upon the sea of dark foliage like the pallid stare of the milky way overhead the stately columns majestic still in their ruin underfoot the dreaming city in the distance the silver sea not on the broad earth is there another picture half so beautiful we got back to the ship safely just as the day was dawning we had walked upon pavements that had been pressed by plato aristotle demosthenes socrates phocian euclid xenophon herodotus diogenes and a hundred others of deathless fame and were satisfied we got to stealing grapes again on the way back and half a dozen rascally guards with muskets and pistols captured us and marched us in the center of a hollow square nearly to the sea till we were well beyond all the graperies military escort ah i never traveled in so much state in all my life i leave the vandal here i have not time to follow him further nor our vandals to constantinople and smyrna and the holy land egypt the islands of the sea and to russia and his visit to the emperor but i wish i could tell of that visit of our gang of quaker city vandals to the grandest monarch of the age america's stanch old steadfast friend alexander the second autocrat of russia the emperor is a man of noble presence tall and spare has a kind blue eye looks great and good and every inch an emperor it was a novel sensation to stand in the presence of this man chatting easily and pleasantly like an ordinary mortal and so simply dressed yet whose slightest word is law to seventy million of human beings who could open his lips and ships would fly through the waves locomotives would speed over the plains couriers would hurry from village to village a hundred telegraphs would flash the word to the four corners of an empire that stretches its vast proportions over a seventh part of the habitable globe and a countless multitude of men would spring to do his bidding if this man sprained his ankle a million miles of telegraph would carry the news over mountains valleys under the trackless sea and ten thousand newspapers would prate of it if he were grievously ill all the nations would know it before the sun rose again if he dropped lifeless where he stood the effect might be felt in the furthest lands of christendom yet where i stood worm of the dust as i am i could have overturned this god i could have knocked this colossus down with my feeble fist but i restrained myself 
if there is a moral to this lecture it is an injunction to all vandals to travel i am glad the american vandal goes abroad it does him good it makes a better man of him it rubs out a multitude of his old unworthy biases and prejudices it aids his religion for it enlarges his charity and his benevolence and it broadens his views of men and things it deepens his generosity and his compassion for the failings and shortcomings of his fellow creatures contact with men of various nations and many creeds teaches him that there are other people in the world besides his own little clique and other opinions as worthy of attention and respect as his own he finds that he and his are not the most momentous matters in the universe cast into trouble and misfortune in strange lands and being mercifully cared for by those he never saw before he begins to learn the best lesson of all that one which culminates in the conviction that god puts something good and something lovable in every man his hands create that the world is not a cold harsh cruel prison-house stocked with all manner of selfishness and hate and wickedness it liberalizes the vandal to travel you never saw a bigoted opinionated stubborn narrow-minded self-conceited almighty mean man in your life but he had stuck in one place since he was born and thought god made the world and dyspepsia and bile for his especial comfort and satisfaction so i say by all means let the american vandal go on travelling and let no man discourage him remember our vandals in the quaker city will never regret their pilgrimage they learned something matters that were useful other matters that were only pleasant much that they learned much that they saw much that they heard they will forget but still a store of softly tinted images will remain in their memories and float through their reveries and dreams for many and many a year to come they will remember something end of the american vandal abroad read by john greenman This is section 8 of Mark Twain speaking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concluding Remarks Protestant Orphan Asylum Benefit, Case Hall, Cleveland, January 22, 1869. Read by John Greenman. Ladies and gentlemen, I am well aware of the fact that it would be a most gigantic fraud for you to pay a dollar each to hear my lecture but you pay your dollar to the orphan asylum and have the lecture thrown in so if it is not worth anything it does not cost you anything there is no expense connected with this lecture everything is done gratuitously and you have the satisfaction of knowing that all you have paid goes for the benefit of the orphans i understand that there are to be other entertainments given week after next for the same object the asylum being several thousand dollars in debt and i earnestly recommend you all to attend them and not let your benevolence stop with this lecture there will be eating to be done go there and eat and eat and keep on eating 
and pay as you go the proprietors of the skating rink have generously offered to donate to the asylum the proceeds of one evening to the amount of a thousand dollars and when that evening comes go and skate i do not know whether you can all skate or not but go and try if you break your necks it will be no matter it will be to help the orphans don't be afraid of giving too much to the orphans for however much you give you have the easiest part of the bargain some persons have to take care of those sixty orphans and they have to wash them orphans have to be washed and it's no small job either for they have only one wash tub and it's a slow business they can't wash but one orphan at a time they have to be washed in the most elaborate detail and by the time they get through with the sixty the original orphan has to be washed again orphans won't stay washed i've been an orphan myself for twenty-five years and i know this to be true there is a suspicion of impurity and imposition about many ostensibly benevolent enterprises but there is no taint of reproach upon this for the benefit of those little waifs upon the sea of life and i hope your benevolence will not stop here in conclusion i thank you for the patience and fortitude with which you have listened to me concluding remarks read by john greenman